Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is BK Bhattacharya. We will be studying today the tool types and techniques of Upper Paleolithic period. You know perhaps, and we have talked about it earlier also, when you talk about Upper Paleolithic culture, this is an artificial division that we make ourselves to understand the past. So past has to be classified in terms of lower, middle and upper, and obviously they are done on the basis of the attributes. The attributes are tool types and their techniques. So the type that, uh, that marks or uh, identifies Upper Paleolithic are the blades. Which is a blade or what is a blade? A blade is just a flake in which the length is more than twice the breadth. So a blade can be obtained by the same flaking technique that we have for taking out a flake, but here the direction of the blow is a little vertical so that a blade comes out. This technique is done or achieved by what is known as punching variety of technique and this is uh, this is done with the indirect puncher, that means the core is kept here, indirect puncher is kept on top of it and then the hammer lands on top of it and then you take out the blade. So punching technique marks the beginning of Upper Paleolithic number one and blade as a type marks the beginning of Upper Paleolithic as a type. So you have a technique and a type defining the Upper Paleolithic cultural period. What are the advantages of a blade? A blade at birth gives you a large number of, uh, large area of sharp border, which a flake did not. And a blade therefore is more efficient than a flake. A blade can be taken and worked as it is, but it doesn't become a type. A blade has to be retouched. A, a border has to be reinforced and sturdied, and then it becomes a type. You have varieties of types, we'll talk about it later on, but let us talk about the techniques. So blade is the initial stage of entering the roadmap of Upper Paleolithic. After that, we find that there are large number of flakes. Large number of flakes, these are thick flakes, which has been worked into varieties of types. So flakes do not go out when Upper Paleolithic begins, flake continues, but they are used to make different types. So technique of manufacture, when you go from middle to Upper Paleolithic, the only new technique that arrives is the technique of punching, which takes out a blade. But this is not all, because Upper Paleolithic is defined by the emergence of a large number of bone tool types, large number of art objects. So you have such bone tool types where you take, there is a point of warning, the word bone tool type is wrong, but it has come into literature, we still use it. No bone can be worked like this. They are all worked on either antler or they are worked on ivory. There is lot of ivory available because of the mammoths that was there in the Upper Paleolithic period. So they are all worked with engravers or, bu or burins and these burins have made these notches and the notches have given what they call as barbs and you have harpoons, you have split base bone points, a large variety of other tools. One of them is very interesting, that is not an effective tool. There is a branch of antler taken and there are large number of holes made in it. People think that this is a baton which is to be used for hunting, but it's not true because there's so much of artwork done on it, engraving done on it, that initially when it was discovered, they call it as a rod of authority, baton the commandment or the rod of authority. Now, this is very significant. Why there should be a rod of authority in a prehistoric community? This was given in order to suppose, in order to propose that Prehistoric society already had an organized society with a kingship or a leadership and the leader has to have a tangible, tangible object, symbol of authority. And this is there even today in Tutankhamun also has a rod of authority. Queen of England when the days of uh, crowning etc. she will sit with a rod of authority. So you have a rod of authority even today. So possibly this is the symbolic, tangible reality of a symbol of your being of authority, let us say leader of a tribe or so on. So you have a variety of bone tools emerging in this period. I must mention about one new technique of bone tools that era, that uh, that starts happening around around 45 to 50 degree latitude. Now, 50 degree latitude was otherwise not occupied in the lower and middle Paleolithic, and it's it's around 15,000 to 16,000 years ago, uh, 15 to 16,000 BC that people migrate to this flat land of of Northern Europe. And there they take the antlers, 
and in the antler they make a groove which is slanted towards the medial end and they make a parallel groove which is slanted towards the distal end. So when the two groups are made like, in the parallelly like this, a splinter comes out and this splinter will have the natural contour of the antler. So it can be used as a very beautiful hook, fish hook and so on. So this technique is called groove and splinter technique. So you have varieties of new techniques of even making or working with antler or ivories emerging in this period which is from about 45 or 50,000 to 50,000 BCE to 8,000 BCE. So this is the upper Paleolithic period where these new techniques come up. There is another point that needs to be talked about. Why there is so much of bone tools? Why there was no such bone tools in the middle Paleolithic period? The reason bone again means this antler and ivory are not bone per se, but the term is used as it is. So why there is so much of bone tools? There is a replete of antlers. An antler is shed by Rang Rangifer Tarendus. Rangifer Tarendus sheds it once a year. Huge amount of antlers and huge amount of ivory available because of the mammoths having a huge tusk. And these were being replete. The people started making tools on them. Another point, some skeptics call it as, well, these are very young periods, so they survive. If anybody made bone tools in the lower Paleolithic period, that's of two million years age, so they may not have survived. We do not know. But point remains that there is a huge amount of upper Paleolithic bone tool types which we don't have in lower Paleolithic period or middle Paleolithic period. Another point that needs to be talked about is not there is not a single piece of bone or bone tool which does not have some form of art or the other. Engraved beautiful figures have been made into bone tools, into, into, into uh, tools of harpoons or batten the commandments. Sometimes even bones have been engraved into uh, anthropomorphic figures. And one of the classic cases is the one that we talk of coming from Willendorf near Austria. And here you find a beautiful human figure, female figurine is uh, sculptured because it is limestone on which it is done. It is sculptured in it. There is no face. There is a bulbous or exaggerated secondary sexual trait, breast and back. But there is no face nor is no hand. And this has been called as Venus of Willendorf. Though Venus is a nickname, Venus refers to beauty. She is not at all beautiful. So otherwise we call it as fe as female statuette or mother goddess. Mother goddess quote unquote because this refers to this refers to fertility. Since these figures don't pay attention to the normal uh, morphology of animal body, but only the secondary sexual traits, it is strongly believed that these were referring to fertility or invoking fertility in the biotic world, not invoking fertility to humankind but by fertility in the biotic world because in humankind we have observed fertility so we, we kind of uh, simulate it in the biotic world which is my subsistence base and I want to make it make it uh, repeat or uh, reproduce so that my subsistence base does not become nullified so you have this kind of art executions coming for the first time in upper Paleolithic. Having said as much for the variety of tool types which are on bones and, uh, and on antlers and uh, ivory, we would go back to the stone tool types. We have started by saying that they started making blades and blades are very beautiful tools with very much of backed element. And here for the first time a retouching occurs. All through the 2.2 million years of human cultural history, man has been constantly flaking to get a sharp border. Here for the first time you find man is working to blunt a border. There is too much of sharpness. There is too much of sharpness. Now if you try to cut a pencil by pushing it with your finger, your finger gets cut because this part is also sharp. So what you do is that you start blunting. In all blade tool types there are two kinds of Retouchings. Retouchings are very important element of identifying the kind of purpose they had in their mind for the tools to be used as and that needs the time, uh, that leads to the type. One of the retouching technique is, is semi-abrupt retouching. That means the retouching is done, this angle becomes a little bigger, ang angle becomes a little bigger and therefore it becomes a little sturdier. It is very common experience. If the angle is very short, like the shaving blade, then it can't be used for more than one or two times because then the, 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 uh, the, the edge breaks. So if you 
uh, like 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 uh, change the shaving blade into the kitchen knife the angle becomes a little more now this is like the angle that a kitchen knife will have and then it is a little sturdier so what happens is that you take this blade and give it a retouching where the angle can be a little increased and then it becomes sturdier it is called semi abrupt retouching one of the first variety, it's about 36,000 BCE, that in Western Europe you find a variety where a blade is taken and semi-abrupt retouching is done all around and this is called a retouched blade or origination blade. It's a very classical type of upper palliative tool. Now this origination blade <clears throat> sometimes is given medial region, a small, small lateral in-curve, a small lateral in-curve is made in the central region and then you call it a strangled blade. Obviously, it looks as if it is strangled, so you call it a strangled blade. A strangled blade and origination blade are two classical types of upper palliative tools. The technique basically emanates from the, from the uh, punching variety in which the blades keep coming. Then you have there is a very interesting blade in which retouching has been done all along the two borders and these retouchings are not blunting the border. These retouchings are semi-abrupt retouching. They have not blunted the border. So this is one of the varieties of retouched blade, which is not origination blade here because it is not retouched all around. If it is retouched all around, then it becomes origination blade. You have blades, broken blade. Now this is how do you know it is a blade? Now it's very interesting. The borders have to be parallel, number one. Number two, it has to be more or less uniform in thickness. So if it is more or less uniform in thickness and even it is broken, maybe it was originally bigger one, it is broken. Blades are very often broken because anyway they are extended and thin forms, unlike hand axes, they can break. So you know it is a broken blade. So you classify it in order, you call them as blades or fragmented blades. Then the retouchings on the blades, are to be looked at to see whether they are backed blades or they are semi-abrupt retouched blade. When it is semi-abrupt retouched blade, you call it retouched blade. Name of the type is a retouched blade and backed blade where name of the type is a backed blade. Now let us look at this blade. Now here is a blade broken obviously is a blade where a kind of semi-abrupt retouching has been done all around in a convex manner at the distal end. And you know that it is the distal end, therefore it is an end scraper. End scraper is a classic type of upper paleolithic tools. In contradistinction to what you had in lower paleolithic and middle paleolithic, which are called side scrapers. Side scrapers are on a flake. This is end scraper and this is on a blade. Let us look at another type. Now this is also upper paleolithic characteristic. You take a blade, blunt a border, give a small tapping blow from one end and you have a kind of a broken part of this which is called a facet and you have an edge which looks like a screwdriver. A blade or a flake in which you give two kinds of blows to obtain a screwdriver edge and actually the screwdriver edge is equivalent to the thickness of the blade. This is the blade and this is the thickness. So the screwdriver edge refers to the thickness of the blade. And this is called burin in French, burin in sometimes, and in English it is called graver because it is believed to have done engraving on bones. Now this is a classic type. This obtains by the intersection of two facets and therefore it is called dihedral angle burin, two hedra. The meeting at an angle is the classificatory order dihedral angle burin. You can have varieties of dihedral angle burins. I can name a few. You have Basque burin, you have Noai burin, you have Bechte flute burin, varieties of dihedral angle burin. These are subtypes of the classic type called burin. This is emergence of a type which is which is perfected in upper paleolithic, but it is there in middle paleolithic also made on thick flakes. I come to a type which is a pinnacle, they say it is a zenith of formation of stone technology. Now what kind of technology and what kind of mindset they had to create an elongated flake of this kind which is just look at the thickness which is less than one centimeter in thickness and you can't make a tool so thin by giving blows on both the surfaces. So it is a biface and yet it is 
less than one centimeter in thickness. This is called a laurel leaf. Now, this technique develops only around 22,000 BCE in Solutrean period. Solutrean tradition is marked by the definition of these laurel leaves. Sometimes there is one shoulder curved out here and sometimes both shoulders are curved out here. Sometimes it is unifacial, then it is called a willow leaf and sometimes it is bifacial, we call it laurel leaf. So, in terms of techniques of upper palliative, you have the punching technique to give you blades, you have the uh, dihedral angle bearing technique as a separate one and then you have the pressure flaking technique devised to obtain these kind of flakes which are so thin and yet by officially prepared beautifully shaped pieces they're known as the zenith of human stone manufacturing technology and after that again there is a decline as you go to Magdalenian period if you some people can claim that how do you know this is a blade, how do you know it was not normally formed. We have cores, we have cores in which we find the series of blade beds. When you find the series of blade beds, you know these cores are rejected or thrown out, exhausted after suitable amount of blades have been taken out. When the blades have taken out, no more new blades can come, they are thrown out. So they are called blade cores and we have many of the blade cores to show the various stages of the techniques. It is not imaginary and it is not accidental that such blades are produced. We can prove that suitable cores have been shaped and then series of these blades have been taken because you have the parallel blade bits evidence there. So. <coughs> You have a varieties of these blades, some thick, some slender, some very elongated and you have varieties of types. The main tool types that define upper palliative are as follows. Retouched blade, backed blade and obviously there are types, I will talk about it. Backed blade, then solitary end point which is by these pressure flicking techniques, bifacial pressure flicking technique and finally the art objects and then art objects or bone objects in which you have the groove and splinter technique also specific to upper paleolithic. In terms of types, each of the variety has so many subtypes so many subtypes that you can really talk of regional archaeology when you find some subtypes in one region and other subtypes missing in another region. So you have the more the attributes of analysis, more the possibility of making classifications. And we are no longer dependent on only hand axe and cleavers. We are dependent on varieties of types and that can give us very good analytical outlines. Finally, if you look at Upper Paleolithic of Europe, you will have certain types that you have to identify as based on the techniques. Let us say backing technique. Backing technique, your blade is taken and one of the border is blunted by vertical blade flaking and the blunted border meets the sharp border at a very wide angle, at almost 90 degree angle, it meets the sharp border. This is called a knife. So you can call it as Chateau Peronian knife. The na name comes from a site in France called Chateau Peron, and you call it a Chateau Peronian knife. You can call it a Azilian knife. You can call it a Hamburgian knife, depending on where it has been found. But knife is a knife in which the backed border meets the sharp border at a wide angle. And the moment this backed border meets the sharp border in an acute angle like this, like this, you have to call it a point. You don't call it a knife. Then you call it a gravation point. A gravation point is a point, a blade in which one of the borders have been blunted in such a way that it meets the opposite border at an acute angle. So it becomes a pointed edge. Somebody or some people feel that there is a genetical relationship of shuttle peronian knife or other knives, blade knives with the points because it seems that a knife is the initial stage and slowly they will develop into varieties of points. The entire upper Paleolithic of Magdalenian period is full of these gravitation points. These gravitation points sometimes become so beautifully slender that if they are mounted on some kind of a haft, they can easily act as a knife, as, as an arrow point, as a, as a javelin or even as a spearhead. We do not know if there are other varieties of uh, non-stone tools also discovered by them because they are all perished. But these are a very rich galore of upper Paleolithic tool types and techniques. Thank you very much. We have already talked about the 
the, the, the intrusion of man into the upper latitudes. When I say upper latitudes, I mean areas which is above Hamburg in Central Europe. So about 55 degree latitude and above that nobody went before uh, Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, even Upper Paleolithic. Basically they all remained in the Central Middle Zones. In the, in the around 15,000 BCE, group of people started migrating to this region. And this region, uh, they uh, started developing three different traditions. Imagine the three different traditions in a small period of 15,000 uh, 15, to 8,000, about 7,000 years. These three traditions are called Hamburgian, Federmesser, and Ahrensburgian. The names are all referring to the places where they have been found. And this is very interesting. Here you find large amount of this backed element, tools with the backed element, that means the knives, you remember the shuttle Peronian knife, the Azilian knife, and also along with that, the Gravitian points, large varieties of them. And with that, the groove and splinter technique, having having angular um, antler pieces. Angular because the angle of the original antler bifurcation has been taken use of or made use of in the taking out of the splinter. So this is a development which was given the name, not Upper Paleolithic, but Epipaleolithic. There are two reasons for it. Earlier it was believed that um, 15,000 or 10,000 Upper Paleolithic ends. But then now we know that Pleistocene ends in 8,000 BCE. So this 2,000 was added in the Pleistocene period. So the culture that was earlier taken as Mesolithic now becomes, most of them become Epipaleolithic. So this 15,000 to 8,000 period is taken as Epipaleolithic culture, number one. Number two, the other reason is that here is a situation which is unlike anywhere else. It's a monospecies adaptation area. Monospecies because we know that all Paleolithic cultures or prehistoric societies had a large variety of adaptation subsistence base because the subsistence base keeps multiplying and changing according to season. So you cannot be monospecies. Monospecies adaptation is taken as a specialization which is, which is before extinction. Any specialization is taken as a step before extinction. So no prehistoric community has monospecies adaptation. But Epipaleolithic of Central Europe shows the development of a complete adaptation to reindeer hunting, reindeer killing, reindeer cult. There is a situation where you, in a site called Stelmoor near Hamburg, you find a whole reindeer is lying in a pit and there's a big stone on its stomach, on, it, on its middle part of the body. So it is believed that they used to also have reindeer sacrifices. And we do not know, but the point remains that when you have monospecies adaptation, your, your anxiety level multiplies. Suppose the ecology changes, all reindeers will migrate to the Lapland, Finland, Iceland you are left with nothing. So a monospecies adaptation is a very risky adaptation. Yet there are three different traditions in a duration of only 700 years where you find monospecies adaptation and these traditions are called uh, epipaleolithic traditions, namely Hamburgian, Ahrensburgian and Federmesser. Ahrensburg and Hamburg are known cities. Federmesser refers to the type. Feder means feather in English and messer means knife. So knife kind of, uh, 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 feather kind, kind of knife. So this is not referring to a place. Ahrensburg refers to a place. Hamburg refers to a place. This is the time also when you find large number of upper Paleolithic regional developments. One is called Pavlovian. Pavlovian also shows those semi abruptly touched blades and not backed blades. Then there is a type develops at a place in Hungary called Seleta, Salatian. And they develop those blood spits on the bifacial flaking technique that I have talked of. So you have regional developments and not to the surprising, Upper Paleolithic is concentrated three traditions in southwest France, southwest Europe. Franco-Cantabrian region. But the region which was not occupied earlier, namely the latitudes above 45 or 55, you start seeing regional developments. Pavlovian, Lingby, Seleta, Jajmanovic, um, these are regional developments. Each one of them, 90% is backed blades and about 10% you see is a non-backed. Pavlov is non-backed, the semi abrupt touching type. And bone tools galore, all kinds of bone tools. One of the sites in Moravia is the Upper Paleolithic site. Here you find again a female figurine of a different kind. I say different kind because of the reason of technique. 
in Willendorf, in Willendorf, it was carved out or sculptured from limestone. Here it was not sculptured. Bone ash and mud, bone ash and mud was used to model, module it. So the technique in these two are different. And then it was thrown into the fire hearth, so it has become black. And it has a face, it has it has a garden like thing in the mid, mid rib region, and it has two slices, two slit on the top of the head, as also two slit where the face would be in the, in the near the face. So it is a little more uh, anthropomorphic, anthropologically or anthropomorphic in feature, and uh, Willendorf is not anthropomorphic so much; uh, it is more stylized. And this is not one. You find other places also in France where this female figure is repeat. Somebody can ask, sir, why so much labor taken to make female figurines and why not male figurines? Well, you do have a male figure at a place called Lausel, where you find a male figure standing with a horn in which something is being uh, put and he is trying to drink the but otherwise, male figures are very much absent. This shows that the cognition of prehistoric man towards fertility was not linked with men. They always thought women have a power to create a carbon copy of our kind in the form of a baby. So women are taken as the one who can, who can create reproduction. And if it is reproduced, then a mango tree should also reproduce more mango. If I keep a, a kind of a Venus, a Venus of Willendorf under a mango tree, then I invoke the fertility on the tree. So it was basically invoking or simulating fertility on the biotic world and not on humankind. The anxiety of human fertility is urban, today's anxiety. This anxiety was not there in prehistoric period. The, the foundation or, or the cardinal point of anxiety in all prehistoric society before uh, statehood formation occurred is subsistence. The, the pang of the stomach, I have to eat. And it is unpredictable. Sometimes you see all animals gone, sometimes you see some animals present, so you all the time invoke some kind of cult, some kind of belief system where you invoke fertility, you wish fertility, you, you kind of try to propose fertility on the biotic world and therefore this is not one. You have uh, Willendorf, one female figurine, Dolly Weston is one female figurine and there are 11 more uh, sites where you have female figurines of this kind. Each one of them shows only exaggerated secondary sexual trait and not so much the morphological features. So if you try to look at the techniques and types of upper Paleolithic period, you will somehow get always swayed towards the non-lithic tools. Lithic tools are limited to 10 to 20 percent. But non-lithic tools become replete with art and forms of sculptures and batting the commandments, harpoons and what not. So you have a huge amount of non-lithic implements which has to be counted as legitimate component of types and techniques of upper Paleolithic culture. But otherwise, stone tools also show some variation. I have talked about two new types that come in the upper Paleolithic and was not there earlier. These two types are called, one is called raklith. Raklith is like a scarum striker. It's a, it can be circular, it can be rectangular also, but all along it has very abrupt retouching. It is blunted deliberately all along like a scarum striker. Much of the speculation about uh, the function of Heraclith was this, that Upper Paleolithic had extensive working with leather. And when you try to uh, scrape off flesh from leather, if you try to take a sharp border, then it will create fissures, it will cut the skin. So you have to use a blunt border, the backside of a knife, to scrape off the flesh. And blunt border, therefore, was specifically required for skin working. And raclet possibly represents one of those types which was invented because of the overactivity of skin working. The second type, of course, doesn't refer to any specific function, but this occurs in late Magdalenian, which is again upper Paleolithic, and this is called a parrot beak beauty. A parrot beak beauty also seems to be somehow genetically linked with raclette in the sense that a flat, thick flake is taken and 
the circumference is already backed and on the backed circumference or blunted circumference you give a tapping blow on the top so that a part breaks off so the second facet is created so you have a facet a single facet and the other part is truncated so it is called a burin on truncation Bo both facets are uh, are man made so one is the blunted border the other is the single blow burin facet and this is a parrot beak burin it doesn't have a very specific function but all burin seems to be uh, you know directed towards engraving there is so much of engraving of of animal figures human figures and so on and so forth even the harpoons that all the time you have to work with an engraver or a burin last but not the least there are varieties of borers these borers are so different from the medial paleolithic and lower paleolithic borers that some of them are like spoke shaped borer and the spoke shaves are so tiny they are given different name in french one is called epine e p i n e the other is called zinken z i n k k e n these are very fine very fine borers on very fine blades now you see the prof profusion of borers upper paleolithic period again indicates possibly the working with the with the uh, skin uh, leather so a leather once you have taken the skin out from the animal then you allow it to dry and when it is dried and tough then you try to make holes in it possibly not to stitch but to make a garment or to cover their hat or so on and so forth this is also linked to the biocultural evolution at that time the biocultural evolution has demonstrated that man became a daytime hunter from around middle paleolithic and daytime hunting required cooling of the skin so by middle paleolithic which is uh, the advanced uh, erectus stage their uh, hair started dropping so all the body hair was lost good enough so he could get a cooling with the daytime hunting but in the night or in the cold period he has started feeling cold now there is no defense mechanism of the body hair so obviously he had to cover himself so the necessity of borers now look borer is an archaeological antiquity and i am trying to link it with biocultural evolution so borer the profusion of borer occurring during upper paleolithic time kind of makes it a very very simply related to biocultural evolution and workmanship of leather varieties of leather objects and leather uh, pieces and so on that about takes takes care of upper paleolithic imperatives their tool types and so on thank you very much